God is good. In all the time. God is good. Lord, give me the wind of the Holy Ghost kind. In the name of Jesus. I want to talk to you this morning about reclamation breakthroughs. And if you remember, this is a year of reclamation for us. And in case you don't remember what that means. That means that reclamation is the act in the process of reclaiming that which we have lost. And believe me, many of us have lost a lot over the last few years. We've lost our spiritual disciplines. We've lost our spiritual passion for the things of God. We've lost a lot of spiritual blessings because we kind of got out of proper fellowship with the Lord. And the Lord wants to get us back so He can minister to us. You remember the, the lady from last week, the mother from last week. They had suffered loss in their family. Her daughter wound up with demon possession. They lost the peace in their home. And this mother went to Jesus and she would not give up. She didn't give out. She didn't wear out. She didn't give up. She kept coming in faith until she got deliverance for her daughter. She reclaimed her daughter's health. She reclaimed the peace of God in her home. And the Lord wants to remind us that we are still in that year of reclamation where we can reclaim uh, things that we have lost spiritually and other things as well. And we're going to start with Psalm 46 and then we'll go to 16 and 103. Reclamation breakthroughs. God is the God of breakthroughs, folks. Amen. In this very familiar text, it says that God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, and though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof, and if I might be permitted to say, and even if the whole world's got COVID, God is still our refuge and strength. And in verse 7 it says, The Lord of hosts is with who? Us. us. <laughs> they say in the mountains, us and us. <laughs> God is with us. The Lord of hosts is with us, and the God of Jacob is our refuge. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Now you can turn to any children's Bible storybook, and you will find story after story, truth after truth of how God ministered to his people Israel. How that he came to them in their times of crisis, and he did some mighty, big, and miraculous things in their lives. How would a shepherd boy, how would a shepherd boy overcome a big, strong, powerful giant? How, what did he need to be able to overcome that powerful giant? He needed a breakthrough. That's what he needed. What would the prophet Elijah need to overcome 450 prophets on Mount Carmel? And 400 prophets of Astaroth. You see, they had lost their spiritual blessing of God. And the land had filled up with false prophets. What would Elijah need? What would it take for him to be over, to overcome all of those prophets, those false prophets? He would need a breakthrough. What would Daniel need? His situation was very unique. They throw him into the lion's den. What would he need to be able to survive the night? What would he need? He would need a breakthrough, a very unique breakthrough, but one that God could provide for him in his life. God is trying to say to you and me this morning that he is the God of breakthroughs. I don't know where you're at and what's going on in your life, maybe in your secret life or life that other people don't know about. You may be bound in some way and you're trying to get loose from it. You're trying to do the right thing, but you just can't seem to do it. God wants to remind you this morning that He is the God of breakthroughs. Amen. You can reclaim the territory that you have lost, spiritually speaking. You can reclaim those things before the Lord that you have lost over the last few years while the world has been dealing with COVID. 
God wants to encourage you this morning and remind you that He is the God of breakthroughs. Amen? Amen. All right. First, He wants to remind us of His ability. Say that with me. He wants to remind us of His ability. In verse 1, it reads, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. And in verse 7 it reads, And the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. There are three things in that first verse that are especially noteworthy. The first one is this. That God says that He is our refuge. If you define that in the word study, it's defined it can be used either figuratively or literally. You can translate it as hope. God is our hope. He is our refuge. He is our trust. He is our protection. I don't know about you, but as I move through my life from week to week, I need some of what's on that screen right there. Amen. I need somebody to hope in. I need somebody to trust. I need somebody to protect me. Mm -hmm. And God is telling us, He's telling His people, whether it's the Old Testament people or the New Testament people, that God is our refuge. Let that sink in on you a little bit and you'll just liable to shout. I don't have somebody else as my refuge. I've got God as my refuge. Amen. Amen. He also says that He is our strength. Strength in various applications. Force, security, majesty, boldness, might, power. Sometimes I just get absolutely exhausted and I need some of that power. I need some help from the Lord. I need sometimes, believe it or not, sometimes I get afraid. I need the Lord to help me overcome my fear. I need Him to be my security. I need for Him to be my strength, my might, my power. And this text is telling us that our God can be that to us. Woo, can somebody say amen? amen? Amen. So he is our refuge. He is our strength and the Lord of our lives. He also says this. He says that he is our present help in trouble. Literally and abundantly available help in trouble. Do you ever get in trouble? Sometimes I get in trouble. I need some help. <laughs> you ever be out somewhere and you get in a, a hard spot and you got your phone with you and you don't have reception? <laughs> you try, try to get some help. God ain't like that, okay? Now, if you're not in proper fellowship with God, it's just like that phone where you don't have reception. But if you're in proper fellowship with the Lord and you're walking in the Spirit, I don't care where you are. If you need God, you need help, you need His presence, He's going to be right there to help you. Hallelujah. That's right. He is available. What does it say? An abundantly available help in trouble. My goodness, no wonder a shepherd boy was able to defeat that old big, ugly, powerful giant. When he wound that one rock, that one stone, up in that slingshot and let it go. Do you reckon there's any power of God behind that rock? What do you think? Now, if you know your Bible, you know that the Bible says that when that truck, that truck, that rock found its target between his helmet up here, that it just didn't hit and fall off. What does the Word of God say? It says that that rock found its mark and sunk up in his head. It had power of God behind it. There's many times in my life I need the power of God to get me through my situation. I need the power of God to get me through and over the enemy. Amen? Amen. And over a time of temptation. But you've got to exercise faith and you've got to walk in obedience before the Lord. Is it any wonder that Elijah stood before they, those 850 prophets and got victory over him when God let the fire fall from heaven. It was God who brought 
the fire from heaven down and consumed the sacrifice and licked up all the water in the trough. And then those 850 prophets were put to the sword and Israel reclaimed their spiritual birthright and their victory in the name of Jesus. You see, people in the Old Testament too had given ground. They had lost things that they need to reclaim. That's what David was doing when he was defeating that giant, was taking back some territory that they had lost to the enemy. That was what was going on on Mount Carmel. Elijah was taking some spiritual territory back that they had lost to false prophets. And you and me, if we have lost territory, we can take it back in the power of God. Hallelujah. Amen. You say, well, I've got a very unique situation. Well, Daniel had a very unique situation too, didn't he? He was in that lion's den. He didn't need God to kill all them lions. He just needed to keep them, keep them from eating them up and clawing him to death. You know, they didn't have to just bite him to kill him. They could have clawed him to death. Just one swipe and that had been the end of it. But God released his power in his crisis when he believed in him and depended upon him and he gained the spiritual ground back that he had lost when his friends had betrayed him. God is trying to say to you and me this morning, if you have lost some spiritual ground and you're willing to get honest with him and do right by the Lord, he'll help you regain that. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Are we going to believe God or not? Yes. Mm. I hope we will. I hope we will. Someone has said that if you take a thimble to God in faith, that he can feel it. If you take God a bucket in faith, he can feel that. If you take God a 55-gallon barrel in faith, he can feel that too. Amen? Amen? The question is, is what are we took before the Lord? We going with little thimbles, buckets, or barrels? <laughs> Amen? Amen? Without faith, it is impossible to please God for those who come to God must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of those that diligently seek Him. Praise God. Are you a thimble Christian? A bucket Christian? Or you got the barrel out? Well, let me let you in on a little secret. It's going to take more than a thimble to get this building behind us over here. <laughs> got to get our barrels out. Amen? We got a window of time here. Let's get our barrels out and let's trust God for this. Let's believe Him for that. But on a more personal note, if you've got issues in your life, God is trying to remind you this morning of His ability to work in your life. Nobody can do what God can do. And God is trying to tell you that He can help you regain, reclaim, retake. Any spiritual territory that you have lost to the evil one, the enemy. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> Breakthroughs all around. Breakthroughs all around. Trying to remind us of his ability. He's also trying to remind us of our choice. Of our choice in Psalm 16. Psalm 16. This is David here. He says, Preserve me, O God, for in thee do I put my trust. In verse 1. Then in verse 8, he says, I have set the Lord always before me because he, God, is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. The context of this is very important. The context is one in which David is a fugitive at the writing of this song. David is actually running for his life from King Saul. Saul has discerned that David is going to be the next king of Israel. That he's going to take his son Jonathan's place and he's upset about that. And Saul has tried to kill David on many occasions. And so David is a fugitive and he's running for his life. And oh yeah, one other thing. David was anointed a decade before this to be the king of Israel. The prophet Samuel had gone to David years before and anointed him to be the king over Israel. But it wasn't going too well for David. God had given him a promise, told him of what he was going to become, 
And here he is, a fugitive, running for his life. How would David respond to that situation? How would David respond to the promises of God? Would he just give up on God because he felt like that God had been too long in bringing about what he had promised? No. It is very important for us to see how David responded. And this is how he responded. David made a choice to trust God with his life and the timing of his kingship. He may not have liked it, but he agreed that he was going to trust God with his life and his kingship and when God would bring that about. Verse 8 is very powerful. David made a personal choice. You know, people can encourage you all day long, seven days a week. They can encourage you to do the right thing. They can pray for you to do the right thing. But honey, that choice has to come from you personally. They can't make that choice for you. You have to make that choice yourself. If you're going to serve God and you're going to be committed to Him, you have to make a personal choice to do that. David says, I have. Not anybody else. I have made the choice to set the Lord before me. It's a personal choice. Are you making that choice? It was a powerful choice. Can you think of anyone better for David to choose to set before him every day of his life? The object of his faith, the object of his obedience was the Lord, his God, in whom he was trusting. He could have trusted his uncle's uh, uh, uncle so-and-so who may have been the best shot in the army or something like that or another guy who is the strongest among the Israelites. But David didn't trust any of those people. He didn't even trust himself. David said, I have set the Lord before me. Amen. Who are we setting before ourselves? Who are we putting our faith in? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him. And He, God, will direct your path. Amen. That's what's going on with David here. Was it to his liking? No. The kingship had not come upon him yet. But I'll tell you this. God gave him the victory everywhere he went. And God gave him one step in front of Saul and his 3,000 chosen men at times. They stayed ahead of him. They never got David. Why? Because God was looking after him. But also it was a perpetual choice. The text says, I have set the Lord always before me. David was not one of these show up one Sunday and then out two Sundays and then show up a Sunday and then out a Sunday and then show up two or three Sundays and then out two or three Sundays. If he did that, he'd be a dead man. Because he wouldn't be walking in proper fellowship with the Lord. Now I understand sometimes we have to miss. But understand this, honey. When you're in a time of crisis, you need to be spot on. You need to have reception. Amen. You need to be able for the Lord to bless and work in your life. And if you're in proper fellowship, if I have set the Lord always before me, who's going to be there for me? The Lord is. Amen. David said, I've made a choice. Personal choice. And a regular, continual choice to set the Lord always before me. And what did that do for David? Look in the last part of verse 8. Because he, God, is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Is that good or what? I shall not be moved. What does that mean? That means that David would never find himself in a situation where he could not function. He would never find himself overcome by fear to where he wouldn't be able to function and go on. God was the strength of his life. God was ministering to him. I have set the Lord always before me because he, God, is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Hallelujah. And it just gets better and better as you read down through there. And it says in verse 9, Therefore my heart is glad. And my soul rejoices. And my body also will rest in hope. Which is a messianic song. Verse 11. That, uh, verse 
It says, Thou wilt show me the path of life in thy presence is fullness of joy, and at thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. And all of this is coming from a man who's a fugitive. <laughs> oh my goodness. You mean to tell me, Pastor, that everything in your life can be upside down, but you can live life right side up? Yes. You can. Our blessing doesn't depend on everything going, what's going on on the outside. It depends on us being in proper fellowship with the Lord and setting the Lord before us every day of our life. Hallelujah. The Lord is our stability. He is the strength of our life. He is our blessing when we walk in proper fellowship with Him. And it gives you a very different focus when you're in proper fellowship with the Lord. Are you a victim or a victor? Even though he was a fugitive, he was a victor. He saw himself as a victor. Even when David had an opportunity to kill Saul in the cave of Adullam, he just reached up there, cut a little piece of his robe off, and let Saul go out. His men could believe, you had, Lord brought him right to you and you didn't kill him? He said, no, 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 no. I will not lift up my hand against God's anointed. He just wanted Saul to see that he is close enough to kill him, but he didn't kill him. He said, that's up to the Lord to take him out. <laughs> David was trusting God with his life and the timing of his kingship. Are you and I trusting the Lord with our life and the timing of all the things that God is allowing in our lives? Or do we see ourselves as a victim? Oh, poor me, it's this awful, it's terrible. God's allowing this. Hey, listen, you are more than a conqueror in Jesus Christ. Remember Romans 8, 28? All things work together for what? Good. Good. All things work together for good to them who are the called according to his purpose. If you walk in proper fellowship with the Lord, the Lord's going to take care of it. All the losses, all the, the good, all the ups, all the downs, God's going to work that out for your good. In verse 37, we read a little bit earlier in the service, nay, in all of these things, we're more than conquerors. We're not victims. <laughs> we're victors. In Jesus Christ. Hey man, this world's not my home. That's right. We need to get our praise on. We need to get our focus upon the Lord Jesus. Amen. God is trying to remind us about our choices this morning. We have to make better choices. In times of crisis. In times of losses. In times of difficulties. We have to sow good seeds. And keep sowing those good seeds until the harvest comes in. Amen? Amen? Are we doing that? Now I know that our nation is not sowing good seeds. And I know our nation see themselves as a bunch of victims. Give me, give me, give me. Because of this, this, this. But as the Lord's people, that's not who we are. We are more than conquerors in Jesus Christ. And when we see ourselves that way... We tend to act that way. Amen? Amen? So it's reminding us of our choices. Are we making good choices? Also, he wants to remind us of his faithfulness. Psalm 103. Psalm 103. He says, Bless the Lord, O my soul. This is David again. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, mm -hmm. who redeemeth thy life from destruction. David had had that experience. Who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfieth thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. David is rehearsing the blessings of God. When's the last time you sat down and wrote out the blessings of God? Or at least made a mental note in the category or a list, a mental list of God's faithfulness to you and to what He has done in your life. When's the last time you counted your blessings? 
You know what we tend to do? We tend to look toward the negative. That tends to be our focus. We can have eight things go right and two things go wrong, and we focus on the two things rather than the eight things. Mm -hmm. Am I talking just to myself? Hey, I do that too. I need to kick in the butt every once in a while myself. Yes, I do. Just ask Donna. She can't get her foot off the floor that far sometimes, and I have to get down. <laughs> yes. Have you counted your blessings lately? Honey, you could be in Ukraine right now. You could be in some third world country. Say, but I'm not. No, you're here. You're doing the good kind of suffering. <laughs> Where a lot of people are doing the awful, awful kind of suffering. Are we focusing on the faithfulness of God? Let me ask you this question. Has God been faithful to his ancient people, Israel? They seemingly have always been surrounded by enemies. Has he been faithful to them? Amen. Yes, just read the book. It's miraculous. They've been surrounded by enemy after enemy after enemy, and God has always seen them through. You see, there's a promise in the book to his people, Israel. I will bless them that bless them, and I will curse them that curse them. He has given them the land, and he has given them the promise that he's going to keep them in the land, and he's going to provide for them and protect them. Amen? Amen. He is a God that is faithful. Let me ask you this question. Has he been faithful to every generation? Yes, he's been faithful to every generation. Are you familiar with the Six-Day War in Israel, 1967? <laughs> Egypt and... Uh, Syria and Jordan and a few others just thought that they would try to dislodge Israel. That little bitty nation didn't have it, like 40 or 50,000, I think, in their army or whatever. You know why they call it the Six Day War? Because Israel defeated them in six days and sent them home with the power of God. Amen. Just like what you read about David and Elijah. It was absolutely amazing. The miracles that took place during that time. I have read reports that they were outnumbered 43 to 1. Listen, if 43 people jumped on you, you think you could take them on and win? That's essentially what they did with the power of God. They overcame. Has God been faithful to every generation? Yes. Here's another question for you. Has God been faithful to you and me? <laughs> See, now that's the question, isn't it? That all is well and good, God taking care of his people. It's all well and good. They overcome the six-day war in six days and sent all their enemies home. And then the rest of the world, by the way, made them give all the land that they took during that time. The rest of the world made them give it back. <laughs> Do you believe that? They did. Made them give it back. Except for a tiny sliver of land here and there so that they can protect themselves. And they will never give it back. Never. What about you and me? Has he been faithful to you and me? Yes, sir. I've thought about that lately. And what kind of response should you and I have to the God who's been faithful to us? Should we be grateful? Should we be thankful? Should we praise his name? Should we honor him with our lives? Absolutely. But folks, it's more than that. There's a huge difference in being told that you need to do something and feeling it in your heart and in your spirit. I don't want to just say it because I should say it. I want to say it and feel it. I want to have a grateful heart. I want to be grateful to the one who took my place on Calvary. I want to be grateful to the one who rose from the grave in resurrection power to save me and give me the power that I might live for him. I want to feel it. Right. Preach it. I don't want to be a hypocrite. Mm -hmm. I want to feel it. I don't want to have fake tears. I don't want to have a fake show. I want to feel it in my heart of hearts and thank him mm -hmm. and worship him. Because 
He is the only one who will ever be 100% faithful to you in everything. <laughs> you think about that. Our mates, our children, our moms and our dads, everybody will let us down one way or another. Oh, God. On Him. And we need to be grateful and worshipful and thankful for that. Amen? Amen. When I was a young pastor, <clears throat> before I get to that, I want to give you our testimony to the faithfulness of God. At the worst times of our life, when we've suffered the greatest losses, house burning, losing a child, all of those things, who has been there for us, Donna? The Lord has. God has. Our testimony to you this morning is that God has been faithful to us. When I am overwhelmed, leap me to the rock that is higher than I. That's God. God said, I will never leave you nor forsake you so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I can say that with fire because that's been my experience. I can say that with passion because that's been my experience. As a child of God, God wants that to be your experience. In your crisis, in your losses, in your ups and downs, He wants you to be able to say, The Lord is my helper. That's your experience. Because He saved you, He's made you a part of His family. And He is a faithful God. I want to feel it. Do you feel me this morning? You feel me? Yes, sir. Yes. Listen, I've struggled with this at times in my life when I was a young pastor. In my second pastorate, I kind of lived like this quite a bit, too much. I'm an emotional person, got emotions. It's easy to get discouraged. And I'd be up here and then I'd be down here. I'd be up here and then I'd be down here. Or we need to live here. <laughs> Never once in a while, bit, baby. You know what I'm saying? You know what it's like living with a person like that? <laughs> it's, it's not a lot of fun, I'll tell you that. Emotional people who live on the bottom side can be very draining. But as a young pastor, I, I kind of uh, would get discouraged too easily and that kind of thing. And apparently it was showing them too much. And you know how God is. He always puts people in your life that can minister to you. You just can't say nothing. Can't say nothing to them. And I had this little old sweet saying of a lady who came up to me one time and I was on the wrong side of it. And she said, Pastor David, has the Lord ever let you down? I can still say, you're Pastor David. Just as sweet as she can be. You know, you want. <laughs> you knew what was coming. Pastor David, has the Lord ever let you down? And of course, I said, no. And that's true, he's never let me down. Now, the Lord doesn't always do things out the way that I want it done. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. God does things his way. So I said, no. The Lord's never let me down. And then she said this. Well, he ain't about to start now. You want me to interpret that for you? You need to stop looking like the Lord has let you down. You need to stop acting like the Lord has let you down. And you need to stop talking like the Lord has let you down. We need to receive that. Because many of us over the last few years have gone around like the Lord's let us down. Like He's abandoned us. The way that we look and the way that we talk and the, our lack of commitment before the Lord, it's like this doesn't matter anymore. Like the Lord's let us down. Not let us down. He has never let us down and He never will. 
So if you have been like me at times in my life, I'm looking like, acting like, and talking like the Lord has let me down. Well, maybe you need to do something about that right now. Mm -hmm. Get on the right side of this thing. Get on the right side of this fellowship. And be patient and keep trusting Him. And keep sowing good seeds until that good harvest comes in. Amen? Amen. Remember, we're the remnant. There's blessing on the remnant. Woo! You need to reclaim some territory. You need to reclaim some spiritual discipline. Some relationships. Commitments. Now's a good time to reclaim it before the Lord. He stands ready. He can do it again. He can do it again in our lives. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's bow before the Lord.